today uh, we have with us Daniel Castaño Diez. Daniel uh, is a senior scientist in the BioEM lab uh, in the Biocentrum of the University of Basel. And he's the author and the developer of uh, Dynamo. And Dynamo is a software environment for subtomoral and average aging of cryo -EM data. And that's exactly the subject of this talk that uh, I'm sure that we will enjoy. Today, I will do a general, uh, I will give a general overview of what is Dynamo and what uh, you can do with it. And then I will go a little bit uh, deeper into the latest uh, research directions that we are taking in Dynamo. So that in order to give some context on how things work, let's uh, remind shortly what would be the typical computational steps in the pipeline of subtomoram averaging. In principle, you should start with a TIL series that would be the raw data from the microscope, as we know. Then we align these TIL series so that the different microlabs, the different projections come in register with each other. With this aligned TIL series, you can create your tomogram, which is a three-dimensional model of uh, what you have imaged in the microscope. In this three-dimensional model, you need the position of the repeating units that you want to align on average, and then you get your density map. It's probably a walkthrough that we are uh, all familiar with to some extent and uh, there is there are the new approaches the new approaches that are emerging in which we take the density map that you got on this first iteration and you use this new information in order to realign your till series to get a finer alignment maybe you can use uh, also the information from an orthogonal classification that you decide there are many variants of what you can do but all of them are articulated along this general pipeline and uh, i will start presenting dynamo exactly in this part of the pipeline in the moment in which you go from the subtomograms into your first average into your density map i will start uh, here because that's actually the historical development on of dynamo which uh, we started to de develop especially having in mind what you have to change in typical pipelines in order to take into account uh, membrane proteins because membranes when proteins are embedded into membranes that's as a membranes are a big intensity feature that make normal approaches fail and that was the origin of the software but once you have your first uh, draft and your first working version your users at that moment my colleagues in Basel they want uh, oh, this could be a little bit more user friendly we need uh, also higher performance and uh, we need more flexibility to go to newer uh, challenges to newer samples so that we started developing dynamo till we have several flavors of, of, the, of it. At the center of it, we have our typical pipeline for basic users. It's basically a single GUI that will drive the user linearly through all the steps. So the user can click his way, just uh, inputting the data, setting the parameters for the alignment, run the project, look what happened. If you don't have too much experience at the beginning you can also let dynamo drive the ride with uh, automatically fitted parameters that may or may not work in any case when you gain experience you will need more and more uh, tools for ctf analysis for browsing large data sets without crowding your memory for aligning different uh, couples of volumes for doing classifications and uh, analyzing them. We try to give a little bit for everybody. Since very simple tools as uh, drawing tools in order to make fine annotations to create the masks exactly where you want to create them, to depiction tools in order to have an idea of the three-dimensionality of your project and what is happening in your tomograms or more complex modules like different flavors of classification 
uh, as in multi-reference alignment or uh, principal components on some others that we are implementing these days. So that uh, oh, the other thing about Dynamo is that uh, it's uh, conceived to work in GPU because GPU is basically the natural language or the natural support for subtomogram averaging projects. At the end of the day, what a GPU wants is that uh, you put your data there. That is when you are going to pay the price for using the GPU in the transfer from your RAM into your GPU. But once your data is in the GPU, you can do a lot of operations for basically or for a very reduced time cost. And that is what Sutomogram averaging is. You have your template and you have your particles and then you test uh, lots and lots and lots and lots of different angles. You can do it in maximum likelihood flavor. You can do it in other flavors. But at the end of the day, it's a game of repeating a lot of times one operation on a piece of data in your GPU. So that Dynamo is very friendly to the GPU. You can test it in your device or you can use our Amazon uh, AMIs so that if you don't have a GPU available or you don't want to go through the, through the travel of uh, installing everything. And uh, that was our first uh, system for Dynamo. We were centered in the aspect of subtomogram averaging proper. The part of, I have my particles, how do I get my average? We have been doing workshops and uh, other divulgation activities in the community since then. And in these activities, we always uh, ask for feedback from the users. What would you like to have in Dynamo? In principle, we were expecting that our users would go for, uh, yeah, I want uh, to be able to do high resolution. I want to know exactly what I have to do in order to get uh, finer structures. I want that the code is faster, uh, the classification could be better, what happens with the CTF. That is what we expected to have in our feedback forms. To some extent, we also did these kind of points. But the absolute hit in our hit feedback forms is, um, oh, sorry, is this part, is the particle picking. How do I get my particles out of my tomograms? That is what. Uh, can really frustrate the users at the very beginning when they try to enter into the world of tomography. Because two reasons. One of the reasons is that uh, this uh, red box in which I symbolize coming from the tomogram to the subtomograms is an overly simplification. In real life, you have tens or even hundreds of tomograms. Each tomogram has a different uh, life and needs a a similar but a different uh, treatment and it's not just a game of uh, having a lot of tomograms it's a game of having very different samples and sample geometries in tomography we do not have this mm, let's say easier workflow that you would find in the single particle analysis in which the geometries are much more reduced the tricks you have to use in order to find your particles are much more difficult in tomography. And each project normally will make you think again if uh, you have the right tools on how, or how you want to adopt the tools that you have used before for a new project. I will give some examples about that. So that uh, in this area, what we suggest is to use uh, what we call the catalog system. It's, um, kind of a database that, all, that drives you hand by hand when you set up your uh, tomography project. The functionalities are, again, they range from the very simple and trivial to the little bit more complicated. You can create it easy, easily with a text file when you have your till series or your tomograms. And uh, you can just use it just to browse and peruse on your different tomograms and to get acquainted with your data set. You can use it to make uh, clever or convenient ways of looking at the tomograms without crowding your RAM, because uh, now tomograms can be up to 40, 60, 80 gigabytes. Uh, 
it's not easy to make them fit uh, comfortably in your run for visualization purposes. That's another thing that the catalog can give you a hand with. But the actual backbone of the catalog is the idea of models. Models are the way in which Dynamo incarnates this idea of having different uh, approaches to different uh, distribution of particles, to different geometries in which the particles are going to be found in your tomograms. So that uh, the model is basically several ways, again, adapted to different geometries, in which the user intervention is channeled into a geometrical shape that describes where the particles are. Let's go, perhaps, for an example. This would be an example of the first uh, thing that uh, a model has to do. It has to drive what you do with the, on your screen from the point of view of visualization. In this case, this model is the model of uh, membrane covering in which the on the visualization side, the model will tell you, ah, OK, if you think you have a membrane here, the model will uh, locate the rest of the membrane with cross correlation so that you have an idea or where the membrane is. Let's say that uh, those are the anchor points that you would find with the with this approach. Then the rest of the model, the second leg of the functionality, would be to guide you through the different steps to convert these anchors of the membrane into um, into an actual selection of particles. And in this case, the model will give you, will throw at you a, a path of different tools. It will create first an spline interpolation, the different uh, set levels of the membrane. Then it will let you make a triangulation. First, a coarse one that then you can control in order to create a smoother one. And on this uh, triangulation that describes the membrane itself, you can define another distribution of points that are going to model where the particles could, or maybe they are not, but it's a putative location for the particles, which is accompanied by putative orienta initial orientations for the particles. And of course, these kind of models are, uh, are uh, formatted in order to connect with the rest of Dynamo so that you can get out of it your first uh, tentative average, your first set of subtomograms, and you are in business to do subtomogram averaging. Of course, that looks like a complicated thing to do. You have uh, hundreds of tomograms in your, uh, in your data set, which is very much likely impossible and uh, advisable. So that uh, the actual idea is that uh, you fight a lot for one of the models, one, two, or three of the models, you create a workflow out of it, and then you use this workflow and you just apply it on all the other models. And this is a good moment in order to say a couple of things about how you do complex protocols in Dynamo. The first thing is that uh, in Dynamo I have, or I used to have, some kind of uh, graphic project management, uh, a little bit Scipion style, until I realized that uh, yeah, it's good to have friends in this world like Scipion. And uh, I prefer actually to use uh, Scipion style workflows. So that uh, it's good that uh, the Scipion team is uh, now porting many functionalities of Dynamo into their env environment. I'm very excited about that. And I'm very also excited about hearing that, uh, at least in the alpha version, there are already some workflows that uh, people will be able to use uh, shortly. And workflows are an interesting thing to have. I want to speak in specifically about one workflow in, in concrete. I think that many, many of us know this uh, iconic data set that I am uh, presenting here. The community jargon, it's called the Young Bricks HAV dataset. And uh, this dataset is important in many ways. Uh, first of all, it was a breakthrough in resolution in the moment that it was uh, published. 
it is a data set with a uh, very good uh, quality and that makes this quality and this uh, another feature of the data set very suitable for testing new algorithms many incoming or many many software that have been released released in the last years have used this data set as a as a showcase and uh, that's why it would be very interesting or very useful if tomo beginners people that want to enter tomography would be able to say okay i just download this data set because it's public and uh, there is a straight line from the raw data that they can download into a high resolution structure but the thing is that uh, that's not so easy if you're just starting with tomography you are going to find a lot of uh, tasks that you need to do and that you need to assess that are going to make your straight line from the raw data into the average quite blurry so that uh, we are uh, we have developed some protocols for the subtomogram averaging part of this not only for subtomogram and averaging part for the full protocol from a to c from npr raw data into the into the final average which are not uh, trivial meaning that uh, you need to do quite a lot of different things that uh, that are not uh, as linear as one would want. One has to identify the vesicles, one has to create a first distribution of particles on the vesicles, create a first average, center this first average, then uh, make an assessment of the quality of what you have, do a new iteration, a new, a new refinement. Then one probably wants to take into account that uh, an initial average based on the different tomograms separately is going to be helpful because they are representing different the focuses the um, this information from different tomograms needs to be correlated and uh, need to be assessed also in terms of geometry to see that uh, you are actually getting the distribution of particles the vesicle that you want to get then you probably need some guidance in order to interpret the cross correlation histograms of the different particles in order to see what is actually happening physically and what the different gaussians in your in your distribution are representing and you have to use this in a constructive way in order to make uh, certain that uh, you are using the missing wedge information properly there are a lot of things including uh, all the pre-processing steps for frame alignment till service alignment uh, that we do with uh, other uh, software packages but well we have uh, we provide a step by step guide guide from a to c with the scripts parameters all the metadata all the intermediate data so that newcomers into the field can really say i start here in raw data i get high resolution tomo a high resolution average um i want to say a couple of words now that i am discussing the relationship of dynamo with other uh, other uh, software packages dynamo is written in matlab this uh, design decision was taken for different reasons for developers mainly it's uh, matlab is a nice framework for a quick prototyping of uh, new ideas you want to do something new you want to test your newest idea well matlab is quite a uh, flexible and nice language to do that and uh, i also think that for users the learning curve for matlab is something that uh, is something quite affordable in any case, there are cons and pros. For the cons, for the bad parts of MATLAB, one could say, well, MATLAB is commercial. Maybe I don't want to pay a license for a commercial software. Well, um, good news is that you do not really need a MATLAB license. If you just want to use Dynamo and not develop it, then uh, with a standalone distribution of Dynamo, we compile it and uh, you can use it without any license that's not a problem 
From the developer point of view, one could think that uh, MATLAB is driving you to slow execution of your code, but that's not true because at the end of the day, uh, it's a question of designing your code correctly and uh, knowing when you have to plug C++ and CUDA uh, parts into MATLAB without, uh, without transfer, without uh, overhead of uh, performance. So that, that shouldn't be a real problem. And, uh, well, from the point of view of users, um, all these different branches of Dynamo that are MATLAB and C++ and CUDA are just a big fat black box that are, is probably not interesting for users, for most users. But I just wanted to make a small, a small comment on the fact that uh, below the Dynamo specific code, there is another uh, library MB tools, which is a totally independent uh, library, does not have anything to cry OEM, and it's an object-oriented library for scientific computing. It is very flexible. And that would be all I wanted to say about the software itself. Now, let me take some minutes for the for another task that Dynamo can do, and it is moving upwards in the flow of the pipeline about the alignment of the TIL series. That's where many users need to uh, want to see uh, some automata automation done because uh, align aligning manually one TIL series is something you can do when you have hundreds of TIL series that is not so, that is not so easy to do. Let Remember, this is why we need to align a TIL series. When you go from micrograph to micrograph in a TIL series, you see this characteristic bump from TIL to tilt that you have to correct for in order to make a reconstruction. In principle, one would say that uh, the mathematics of this doesn't look so terrible. It's just a less square problem. What should be so difficult here? And the difficulty is actually not solving the equation itself, not this minimization problem, is just uh, how to characterize the data, how to find trails of observed fiducials. What do I mean with that? What I mean is that, uh, in principle, one could think that it's very trivial to find to identify the same three-dimensional marker from tilt to tilt. This blue marker is obvious where it was in the, each micrograph from tilt to tilt. That's uh, no problem. In real life, that is what we would do when you when we take uh, Dynamo or, or, or iMode and you click so with uh, patience each gold bit in each uh, micrograph minus three, zero, three, et cetera, et cetera. That's, uh, that shouldn't be a problem. The thing is that if you want to do it automatically, in principle, things can get complicated for the computer. Things are not so easy. If you have a good thresholding system, maybe you can, but it's not said that you are going to find a good trail indexing out of this uh, accumulation of clouds. In principle, what we could say is, okay, we can say that the cross-correlation peaks that count are those that actually behave as gold beads. So that uh, their positions are coherent with the three-dimensional alignment model that we have. But on the other hand, we need to have these trails in order to have a three-dimensional alignment model. In other words, it's uh, kind of a chicken and egg problem but we know what to do in mathematics when we have these kind of problems. A good entry gate is an iterative refinement. And that's exactly what we do. Basically, that would be our initial till series. We compute all cross correlation peaks everywhere in every micrograph in the till series. And then we go initially comparing every two micrographs 
in order to find the most likely shift between two micrographs. And this shift is only used in order to make an uh, to make an assumption about which points could be part of the same trail. Obviously, this initial uh, this initial trail assignment is very faulty, but the question is that with this initial assignment of trail, we can, can generate a three dimensional model. We can use it to reassign the trails, and at the end of the day we normally get a good alignment after two or three iteration. That is how the till series looked after alignment. There are different things that we can do in order to make this alignment a little bit better, like uh, taking into account that gold bits are not really spheres, so that we can use their actual shape in order to make the alignment a little bit better. And uh, in any case, we also have some batch system so that uh, it is the same idea that I described that I described before for the model workflows. You just uh, fight a little bit with one or two or your till series. You find good good parameters for your automated alignment workflow, and then you use those parameters on every one or every till series in your in your batch. And if some of it, uh, some of them happens to fail, then uh, well, you can align that one with your uh, um, with, uh, with with other with other parameters, and you can analyze it with the interactive tools that we have for those still series that you want to that you want to align separately. So we have used these parameters or sorry this workflow on basically everything that we have found in MPR and uh, it seems to work quite nicely on an automated manner on all of them so that we are on our way to create an integrative pipeline putting really together all of the steps of the modular steps that we have in Dynamo so that we can actually implement uh, this idea of reusing the density maps in order to realign the till series taking into account the different deformations the different volumetric deformations that happen during data acquisition, data acquisition so if you want to know more about dynamo we have our online documentation we have uh, our online forums and we will do our next uh, our next workshops in Lausanne in October, Bilbao next year, EMBO workshop, which is virtual, also in September. And we will do some also presentation in Lisbon based on Scipion, actually. And uh, that's it. I just want to thank to my team, to Stefano, who is working in, in the protocols, Carlos, working in the TIL series alignment, Rafaele, working in the classification, and the, our external Dynamo member, Alistair Board, which works in the user support. And uh, that would be all from my side. And I will take uh, questions if you have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Daniel, for uh, this talk. If uh, any of you have uh, a question to ask, uh, you can ask or uh, write it in the chat. Uh, meanwhile, let me uh, ask if uh, uh, it's regarding with the, the alignment that uh, you presented at the end. Many times when I carry out the alignment, I wonder how if there is a kind of a metric or something to determine if the alignment is good or if it's bad, because uh, at the end, what I think user used to do is to to observe some fiducials and check if how they change. Or I like it when you put 
the projection of the fiducials, then they fall in a kind of a straight line. But uh, I think the metric you use is the root mean square. But uh, I, I well, don't know if there is a metric or something to to determine this is good, this is bad. Yeah, that's uh, that's a <laughs> that's a very good question. At the end of the day, it's uh, what uh, you say. You really, in order to be totally convinced that what you are looking at, you should use, uh, for instance, these tools that I described before, these visual tools, like the tilt lines, they have to be straight. You can also click on the different uh, goal bits and see the movie and see that uh, during the movie, they are totally straight. And uh, But about uh, if you want a real, real merit, the RMS, can be very deceitful because you can get uh, an RMS of zero point something if you just have one observation or a couple of markers or so that uh, normally what we do is uh, we give the RMS but we also give the three dimensional uh, distance between the markers because the RMS is more uh, is a stronger measure the more um, the farther away are the markers from each other in 3D. You have two markers that are very close to each other. Um, this RMS is basically telling you nothing because it's uh, you when basically when you see a, a, the condition number of the matrix in the least square, that is uh, basically nothing and you are inventing, inventing numbers. So that basically that is what we do. Um, we also give the degree of recovery when we want to assess the quality of the of the uh, of the alignment the degree of recovery means that uh, if we know that we have uh, 50 gold bits in the data set after running our iter our iteration our um, both the assignment and the realignment and uh, how many observations we have left so basically, they, there are three numbers that uh, we give the RMS, the the, distribu the spatial distribution, and uh, yeah, and the the, the number of uh, successful detections. Okay, I see. Thank you. And um, well, Borja Rodriguez uh, asked, uh, "Hi, nice presentation." I have a question. Is there implemented an automatic fiducial less alignment in Dynamo? Um, there is one, but there is not yet uh, released. Basically, what we do is take, uh, we use this system for, that we use for the for alignment and uh, we use it, sorry, the same system that uh, can work with, uh, with gold bits can work with uh, generic three-dimensional features so that we are uh, testing what we have but uh, it's not yet released there are uh, many things that uh, work good that work well when you have uh, gold bits but are not so nice when you have uh, generic abstract features so that uh, no, moment momentarily it's not uh, it's not public we hope that we will solve um, our problems and at least for some samples we can release it soon. It's interesting to have something like that because uh, now people are using more and more cryo-feed data set, data sets in which uh, normally you will not have uh, gold bits. So the necessity for a markerless alignment system is increasing. Yeah, it's a very good question. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Fede? Ask uh, how does Dynamo generate the goal bit chain, and how does it recognize the same fiducial uh, through the tilt series? Okay, the initial that went a little bit too fast in the movie, I guess. There are two questions here. The first one: How does Dynamo generate the goal bit chain? Let's say that uh, you start with uh, all your gold bits and a lot of uh, artifactual peaks of the cross correlation 
you can trust your thresholding algorithm uh, that you will not have a lot of garbage but in principle mm, you will have i mean it's uh, you cannot avoid it so that what do we do we start with micrograph one and micrograph two and say i'm going to shift the positions of the putative positions of me of the of the cross correlation peaks in micrograph two for every possible shift on micrograph one basically what i'm doing is i'm uh, I'm aligning two clouds of points. And uh, I say that the alignment that will work will be the one when you have uh, the highest number of matches because uh, actual gold bits, cross correlation peaks that are created by gold bits will be coherent along the till series and uh, rubbish peaks will not be coherent. So that, that is uh, what we do. We get uh, match. A number of matches from tom from micrograph one to micrograph two then we do the same micrograph two to micrograph three micro as we have a lot of matches between each part of tomograms then we identify which matches propagate from micrograph to micrograph and of course the question is that uh, at the very beginning we will not have a lot of uh, chains that are uh, that are uh, very long and actually we will not have a lot of chains that are correct but it doesn't matter because uh, we will have some of them that are correct and that's enough to uh, to start this iterative process because uh, the wrong chains will simply disappear because they are not coherent with each other in the next alignment step okay Thank you, Daniel. And Jorge Jimenez de la Morena uh, asked, uh, does Dynamo offer some kind of uh, per particle per tilt refinement? Yeah, um, this functionality is, uh, is basically bound to the same library of GPU tools that I'm using for the fiducialless alignment so that uh, it will be released at the same time, or it cannot be released before the fiducialist alignment is actually operative in the in the GPU. But uh, in, but yeah, this is the idea. The idea is that at some point we can we will put this functionality in public. Uh, 